good evening, and welcome to Having a Drink with Mink. I'm your host, Jason Mink, and tonight, do I even need to say it? I'm going to set this over here because you'll notice I'm surrounded by comics. Why is that? Well, let me tell you. Last week I talked a little bit, actually I talked quite a lot, <laughs> about one of my childhood favorite comics, Marvel Tales. Now I loved Marvel Tales as a kid not just because it featured Spider-Man, but because it reprinted all of those classic uh, Lee Ditko comics that you just couldn't get anywhere else. But my love of reprints doesn't just end with Spider-Man. Beginning in the 1960s and all the way through the 1980s, Marvel kept kids like me happy with multiple titles featuring stories from every era of the company's existence. Tonight, we're going to explore some of those titles. So put on your comic reading pants, make yourself an adult beverage, and set back for the old guys who like old comics guide to Marvel reprints. Let's do it. Welcome back. So, the first source of reprints are the Marvel Comics Annuals, or Specials. While the annuals began as summer showcases for new stories featuring the title characters, Marvel soon began reprinting previously published stories to fill these oversized comics. The annuals will not be covered here, as this episode is focusing on the second stream uh, more common for reprints, which are the specialty titles that Marvel produced between 1964 and 1981, like this one. Reprints also made up the bulk of uh, Marvel's tabloid or treasury sized editions, but these will be the focus of their own upcoming video. Got it! Enough of my balloon juice, let's get right to it. So yeah, Marvel Collector's Items Classic. This was a bi-monthly title which debuted in February of 1965. The first issue reprinted Fantastic Four 2, Tales to Astonish 36, which featured Ant-Man, Journey into Mystery 97, which featured Thor, and Amazing Spider-Man number 3. Uh, Thor was gone by issue 2, Spidey followed in 3, replaced by Doctor Strange and the Hulk respectively. This lineup remained stable until issue 12, when Iron Man began to appear. Let's take a look at that. Soon, the Hulk vanished, leaving just the FF, Doctor Strange, and Iron Man. Then, with issue number 23... Ah, oh, what happened to 23? Dang it all! With issue number 23, the book was renamed Marvel's Greatest Comics, a less cumbersome title for certain. Comic uh, Captain America joined the book by issue 25, and uh, Cap and fellow Avenger Iron Man would leave shortly after, getting their own title, leaving collector's items classics in the hands of the FF. Now, with issue number 34, the book was downgraded from its previous hefty page count to a regular 20 center with your typical 32 pages. Now this book soldiered on until issue number 96, cover dated uh, 1981, and uh, that's this is 93, but close enough, <laughs> and uh, reprinted a lot of great Fantastic Four stories in the process. Next up, Marvel Double Feature was a bi-monthly title that appeared from December 1973 to April of 1977. Now this title featured Captain America and Iron Man uh, in stories called From Tales of Suspense, numbers 77 to 99, as well as Invincible Iron Man number 1. 
Now, while Cap and Shellhead had known terrific success, both as Avengers and uh, in their own comics, the reprints didn't really do a whole lot as far as it goes, uh, judging from the low numbers, but yet uh, you did get some great covers for sure. Awesome Gil Kane. Fantasy Masterpieces began its life as a bi-monthly 68-page comic reprinting Marvel's abundant pre-superhero monster comics. But by issue 3, Golden Age Captain America tales began appearing in the title. By issue 7, Cap was joined by old friends Namor the Submariner and the original Human Torch, Jim Hammond, turning the book further away from its original intent. Then, in issue 10, the All Winners Squad appeared. Captain America, Namor, the Torch, and the rest of the team teaming up. But it was number 12 that saw fantasy masterpieces morph into Marvel superheroes. Cap squatted among the reprints for two issues before giving his own title, leaving Marvel superheroes as a bit of a mutt. Marvel was attempting to get a bunch of different characters off the ground, and they used this magazine as a launching pad. After that, we saw stories from uh, Medusa, the Inhumans, the Black Knight, and even Doctor Doom. Now, as a title, Marvel superheroes clearly lacked identity, and its constantly rotating cast of leads didn't help matters. By issue number 21, the experiment was up. Resources were reallocated to up-and-coming projects, and new stories in the book stopped, with the title simply becoming another Silver Age reprint. Worse still, the colors often suffered from uninspired layouts and dull coloring. Iron Man came back along with Daredevil very briefly, but by issue 23 the page count was cut in half and the book joined all of the other 20 cent marvels on the newsstand. And here we have that particular book, issue number 32, now featuring the previously proven team of the Hulk and Namor. This book began reprinting Tales of Astonish stories. The two would share the title until issue 55 when old Greenskin nudged his fishy friend out of the way and kept the book for himself. The book continued until issue 105, ending with a reprint of Incredible Hulk number 157. Marvel Superheroes is an odd book. It lacks the cachet of Marvel Tales, but it deserves more respect, especially the 68 pagers, which featured art from many comics greats like Joe Manili, Bill Everett, Dick Ayers, Reed Crandall, Joe Simon, and Jack Kirby, among many others. The title was a great way for new readers to get their hands on seminal stories by industry giants, providing context and contrast to Marvel's Silver Age of Superheroes. Thanks to the improved distribution of its books and the increasing popularity of its characters, Marvel began to consistently outsell former number one comics publisher DC in the early 1970s, but the company wasn't content to rest on its laurels. Marvel doubled down on its reprint strategy in a bid to force rival content off the shelves and spinner racks, employing questionable practices like reissuing old stories with new contemporary looking covers and language. Soon readers were faced with a deluge of reprints to wade through, oftentimes indistinguishable from Marvel's ongoing titles. I know that when I was a kid I had no idea what the hell was going on. In fact, I'm still a little foggy on some of it, but let's jump right in. Kazar number one through three reprints the Jungle King's previous adventures in Daredevil and Amazing Spider-Man. You gotta hand it to the guys at Marvel. They tried just about anything to see what stuck. This one didn't. Marvel 
called Triple Action first appeared in February of 1972 and were printed Fantastic Four number 55 through 60. These early issues featured the Fantastic Four, the Silver Surfer, and Doctor Doom. But by issue 5, a new supergroup was taking up space. The Avengers squatted in Marvel Triple Action for the entirety of its brief run, with the book reprinting Avengers 10 through 54 of the team's title, although uh, the occasional story was dropped for one reason or another. The title ends with Avengers 47, but the Avengers weren't out of the reprint game just yet, but more on that in a bit. Speaking of the Avengers, Thor threw his winged hat into the reprint ring with 1972's Marvel Spectacular. This book collects Thor number 116 through 134 and remains one of the most visually stunning of the reprint books, as every issue features Jack Kirby art. While Stanley's take on archaic idioms occasionally threw me, Jack's visual language was instantly accessible to young Mink. Stranded in an age where even cutting-edge technology like televisions and automobiles had wood paneling, Kirby's out-of-sight tech and character designs left me star for a less mundane world. Marvel Spectacular is a real high point for the reprint titles. For us kids, June of 1974 not only brought summer vacation, but a new Human Torch comic as well. Disappointingly, this book was not a contemporary offshoot of the FF, but instead it contained reprints of Johnny Strange Tales days. And while this strategy worked well enough for characters like Spider-Man, somehow these Strange Tales, despite barely being ten years old, felt very dated. Let's face it, the Marvel of the mid-1970s was a very different animal than its 1960s incarnation, and these older stories simply didn't move readers or magazines on the newsstand. In spite of later issues featuring the Fantastic Four, the Human Torch's title was snuffed out with just eight issues, leaving in its wake one of the great unexplored what-ifs of the disco era. Now, Marvel Adventure was another bi-monthly book from 1975's House of Idea, set to reprint old Daredevil stories. Uh, it began with issue 23, which seems like an odd choice, but remember, Marvel had been reprinting in a hodgepodge fashion for a good long time, so they'd probably already covered 1 through 22 somewhere else. This book only ran for five issues. But it wraps up with a stilt man story, so they went out on a high point. Marvel Super Action number one appeared in May of 1977, and uh, no, I didn't put a cigar on on Captain America's face. This is actually just a printing error, but hey, that's why I got it for a buck. Now, uh, this reprints Captain America number 100, which was issue number one of Captain America's own book, but carrying over the previous numbering from his Tales of Suspense run, which had gone up to number 99. So, we have uh, an issue 100 that's an issue number one. And, uh... There's also an issue number one here in the uh, Marvel Super Action. Now Captain America hung out in Marvel Super Action up until issue number 14. And we got some uh, great Captain America stories. Marvel Boy actually dropped in. But uh, the title abruptly shifted with issue 13 uh, picking up with Avengers number 55, which is where Marvel Triple Action had left off. Weird, huh? At any rate, this was one of my favorite titles as a kid, uh, because you basically got all of the really good stuff. The John Buscema artwork, the Hank Pym slash Vision slash Ultron storyline, and uh, what could I say? This book brings back a lot of great memories. I remember this one in particular. I love this cover. Fantastic cover.
And then the final issue, which was uh, November of 1981, issue 37, featuring, I believe, Avengers number 87. In 1979, Marvel dusted off its fantasy masterpieces moniker, repurposing it for a vehicle for its original Silver Surfer book. Unlike other reprints of the time, Fantasy Masterpieces Volume 2 was a deluxe book featuring additional pages, as well as a higher price point of 75 cents. Marvel gambled that fans would snap up these long out-of-print stories, even if they were a little more expensive than a new comic book. But the concept didn't have enough gas to even finish the original Surfer run, falling short by four issues. Volume 2 ended with, um, issue 14. Surfer having picked up fellow traveler Adam Warlock along the way. That was it. There were a few odds and ends after that, of course. Uh, Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos became a reprint title starting with issue 80 and uh, running all the way up through 167, simply representing stories that had debuted a decade before. Here's the last one. X-Men went that same route. Here we have them appearing in uh, their early adventures. Amazing adventures. More Lee Kirby goodness rounding out the late 1970s. But that was pretty much it. By the early 1980s, Marvel would aim its reprints not only at the newsstand, but the direct market as well, re-releasing seminal works without ads or other interruptions to the story on high-quality paper. I have some of those around here somewhere, but I couldn't tell you where. <laughs> Between 1964 and 1980, Marvel reprinted its own work ceaselessly, but instead of killing demand for their product, they created an entirely new market, providing younger fans access to older stories they might otherwise only hear about secondhand. In spite of the drop-off in creativity and vision in the overall Marvel line of this period, the constant refreshing of its own legacy ensured characters like Spider-Man, Hulk, and Captain America would not soon be forgotten. For the old guys who like Old Comics Network, I'm Jason Mink. If you enjoyed this content, please consider supporting us at the link below. Thank you.